Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Global Foundries with Tom Regev, who's going to talk today about 14 nanometer uh, reference flows and some of the problems that you have moving to 14 nanometers in FinFETs. So, Tom, there's certainly an improvement in terms of power and performance when you're moving into a 14 nanometer FinFET, but um, it's not so easy from everything that we've heard. What do you have to know to get there? Uh, so definitely, yes, as you mentioned, uh, you will get a lot of performance improvement and a lot of power reduction as compared to any other node uh, because of the 3D structures of the FinFET. But it comes with a price, and the price is the challenges you have. It's no longer just colorless, right? Now you actually have to map the color in different directions. Correct. So um, basically because we don't have the new... Uh, or, or the EUV, the Advanced uh, Ultraviolet uh, uh, Litho for, for uh, the FAB, uh, we have to find a solution, a smart way to deal with the current equipments and still reach to the uh, fine print that we need in that node. Uh, and that means you have to divide them into two masks. Uh, the coloring is not the problem uh, because the decomposition deck will take care of that, so it will try to alternate the coloring to distribute equally on the masks, and that means you will have a density and color balance uh, to guarantee the yield and, and the printability. The problem that when the two masks shift uh, together, and that means the capacitance will increase on one side and will decrease on the other side. But this also will, will be taken care of by using the new corners we call DP corners for, for the back end. So why don't you draw this out for us? Show us what we're actually up to. Up against. Sure. So basically, for um, the normal nodes, if you uh, draw the resistance and capacitance curve, you have four corners that kind of uh, resides on an el ellipsoid like that. And you have the nominal corner. So if this is the nominal, so you have a Cmax corner, R Cmax corner, and then uh, R uh, Cmen corner and R Cmen corner, and that's without any coloring. But when when we have the color information, all what we need to do is to have another ellipse that will have the new corners. So you will shift each corner a little bit further. So you will have a new node here, which what we call it RC min DP. You have a new node here, a new corner, which C max DP. And the same thing for the other nodes. So for each corner, you just add extra variability, which is the variability because of the mask misalignment, but the number of corners will stay the same. You don't have to sign off on a lot of corners. We just try to recommend uh, five corners to stay the same with all the variability added within the corner. You know, one of the things that we're also hearing about is uh, 3D extraction. What exactly is that? So basically, because of the FinFET, a 3D structure. So you have the FinFET, you have the fin and the gate around it. So that means if this is the fin and you have the gate surrounding from three direction, the channel here is completely controlled from three directions, so you can turn on and off the current. But the problem when you try to connect with the diffusion here you have a little bit of complication. It will not be one contact to metal one. You will have at least two or three layers to reach to via zero and met one. And this extra layers, it's different cross sections, and that means all the capacitance that you will have between the gate and all those structures are a little bit complicated and it has to be extracted in a 3D way to guarantee the accuracy. So some of these capacitances are included in the device model, some of them will be pre-characterized and coded in the tick file, and some of them has to be extracted on the fly from uh, the extraction uh, tool. So it's either star C, QRC, any extraction tool needs to add the rest, 
And the way we code it, we use something called extended tech file uh, syntax, which is ITF or ICT based. They had to include this extra parameters to account for the 3D ext uh, extraction. The capacitance has been a big problem. I mean, we're, we're starting to deal with something called the Miller effect now, right? Correct. What exactly is that, and how does that apply here? So because of this extra capacitance we have, that means the amount of pin capacitance of each cell will increase. And in, in rough approximate uh, terms, I think it will be about 50 to 60 percent increase in capacitance from 28 or 20 nanometer. And that means if you have the capacitance between two lines, and this is the capacitor, and you have here two signals, signal one and signal two, these two signals are switching. And if both of them are switching in the same time or in reverse direction, that means the impact, the real effective capacitance can be reduced or increased. So if they are switching in, in different direction, that means the capacitance can be increased in effect, and, and that means it will impact the timing, and that's what we call Miller effect. Uh, the impact on timing will make the, tra the, the waveform, and instead of going like that, going really fast here, and then saturates at VDD, in this case, when you have more capacitance, it will go and have long tail till it reaches to VDD. This long tail will affect the actual delay you will get from the cell. And that uh, what we need to consider in the STA. And the way we include it in the STA, we include uh, or enable something called waveform propagation. And the waveform propagation actually takes the real waveform and try to propagate it from one node to another in the STA tool to guarantee some accuracy at the end when you measure the delay. The Miller effect was first theorized back in the 1920s. Correct. So why is it it's starting to become reality now? So what changed is the impact of the Miller capacitance in the past, although it was very, very well known as theory, it never affected the waveform much because you have high voltages, you have strong drive current capability from the cell. So the waveform was smooth, was saturating at VDD immediately. You, there is no long tail, there is no um, uh, kind of secondary effects in the waveform that kind of misshapes the, the waveform. And that's what we face is now with the small structure of the devices and the cells and the existence of the Miller capacitance with the increase of this type of capacitance, which we call it MOL or middle of line capacitance, the impact on the waveform became significant. And that was the first time we need to include it in our uh, calculations, although it will uh, complicate a little bit the, the, the flow or complicate the tool, uh, but it's taken care of. Both Synopsys and Cadence and a lot of the STA tool providers they already enabled the waveform propagation feature because of this, because of the impact. You know, we've also been hearing about um, process variability at, at any new node, but with uh, when we start getting into the FinFET world, we're starting to, to deal with random process variability, right? Correct. What's, what's changed? Uh, what changed is, again, the ratio or the relative impact of, of the device variability. So if try to find some spot here, so basically, if this is the curve for the Gaussian distribution of the global variability, so you have the device, this is the TT point, and you have here the SS global and the FF global. And around this point, you will have another variation. Let me do it in another color. So this another variation, it's actually random device variation. That means the variability from one transistor to another on the same die will be impacted by this curve. And that means you will have another variability added that we used to take care of it at SS and FF. So you used to take the three sigma of global variability, three sigma of local variability. Now the, with the lower voltage hedron that we have, VDD became smaller, 
And we cannot assume the worst case at SS and FF all the time, because in reality, these random variables are canceling each other. So when you try to go in reality and try to sign off at these corners, you, there is no headroom. There is, uh, there is no way you will be able to meet your timing uh, with all this pessimism included in the design. So the way you do it, we go back and try to go to something it was a long time ago, a lot of people tried, which is the statistical static time analysis. But because of the SSTA was really tough to run, it takes very long time. So now we can characterize the library here and do this variation left and right as late and early by something new. Uh, it's a new IEEE standard, it's called LVF or Liberty variation format. And this liberty variation format, we will have a table for the delay as function of slew load. We'll have another table for sigmas associated with all these delay points. For the constraints, the same thing. For hold and setup table, we'll have another table for how much uncertainty for the setup and hold time. The output slew will not be consistent. It will not be static anymore. The output slew will be function with sigmas as well. And when the STS start propagating the signal, it will not propagate the signal as it is. It will start propagating from one flip-flop to another, or from one gate to another. It will start propagating the sigma variation around the mean. So if this is the delay value, there is a lot of variation around it with sigma 1. And then propagated, it will be D2, which is the delay value, with another sigma, sigma 2 and so on and start propagating a delay and variation around the delay by, uh, by the way, uh, or uh, by, by a way of uh, RSS, root square of sum. So when you reach at the output, you will have an accurate estimation of how much variation you really have in the device. So one of the ways of dealing with this in the past was that you would add in margining, guard banding. You can't do that anymore. That's exactly what you're talking about here, right? Exactly. If, uh, if anyone will try to add all this amount of variability in a constant number, that means you are overkilling your, your uh, design, and it will never happen except in extreme cases. So that's what this will target. It will try to give the, this D rate, but the D rate based on the design, based on where your cell is and how it's loaded. So it's kind of tailored D-rate. So this is the whole uh, methodology behind correct by construction, is it not? Correct. So this is correct by construction in the timing. We have another correct by construction in the physical implementation. And that's another problem that uh, when you are shrinking the device dimensions, you have a lot of design rules you have to satisfy. And it's not the rules of what we call DRC only. We have another problem that you have to guarantee that the litho on the silicon will be printable. And that means you need to avoid the hot litho spots. And all this have to be included in the implementation cycle early on. And that's what we call InDesign DRC and InDesign pattern matching. And we have also that's coming soon InDesign EMIR. Because if you wait till the end of the cycle of the design, it's too late to go back and do ECO cycle to uh, adjust your design. It will be too late and it will take very long time. But when you do it on the fly, you will guarantee that the placement, the routing, the optimization, all of those took taken care of into account uh, all what will be needed from design, from pattern matching, from uh, EMIR, or even uh, from uh, how it will be placed to be implant aware as well. Tama Regev, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.